The empire of fashion has broken down in the last 50 years. We no longer have everything ruled from Paris with one couture house like the original Christian Dior, where a new style is introduced and everyone copies it the world over. Instead, we have what my friend Ted Polhemus calls multiple style tribes all around the world. And we can't always understand what the other style tribes are saying. Sometimes one person's clothes are completely incomprehensible to another person's. And certainly this Galliano outfit is not immediately clear what does he mean by this. Now, he said in published interviews that he'd been influenced by Maasai culture in East Africa. I, I don't doubt that he was, but I think he was probably also influenced by Dinka culture also in East Africa. And here you see a beaded Dinka man's corset. It's not really a corset, but it looks like one. Here you see a show that I did in New York on the corset, and you see in the center an authentic Dinka corset. On one side, Galliano's ensemble for Dior, and on the other side, Christian Lacroix's ensemble, which is also ethnically inspired, perhaps a little of Africa, a little of Southeast Asia, etc. Fashion is like a giant uh, Hoover that sort of sucks up all kinds of interesting looks from all over the world, different cultures, different subcultures, mixes them together, and is frequently accused, therefore, of stealing ideas and ripping out all of the authenticity and then just spewing it forth as part of this great fashion machine. It's also often thought that fashion is really just a modern Western phenomenon. And to some extent, that's partially true, although as you'll see, in the larger sense, it's not true at all. Now, so there are differences between many kinds of traditional clothing and modern fashion. Here you have an Ottoman caftan. It doesn't change every season. It's not a question of you decide you want to wear one with long sleeves. No, if you're wearing one with long sleeves, that means you expect someone to come and kiss your sleeve. It's a particular sign of, of rank. So this outfit indicates your rank, power, status, your gender, your religion, the time that it's worn, everything about it is set. Nothing is up to the individual choice of the wearer, or very, very little. The Ottoman Empire, as you know, was a huge multi-ethnic empire that swept from Turkey all the way through the Middle East and into North Africa. And within this empire, there were not only Turks, but Arabs, Christians, Muslims, Jews, and they all wore different kinds of clothing. So for example, you have here various people who are Jewish doctor. Top center is a Jewish doctor. To the left is a man of the law. To the right, with the long plume, is a janissary, a soldier, etc. Now, you didn't decide what you wanted to wear. It's a little bit like if you were in the army. You were drafted into the army. You wouldn't say, you know, I really like the way a general's uniform looks. I'm just going to wear that today. You, ha you had to wear what was appropriate to you, your rank. And if you didn't, the penalty could be death. So that's very different than the modern fashion system, where you're very much choosing what you want to wear. But that doesn't mean that fashion is just a modern Western phenomenon. Here you see two statues of Tang Dynasty court ladies. That's about 800 AD in China. And this is incontestably fashion. Uh, these ladies' mothers didn't wear the same clothes as this, and their daughters didn't either. The fashion changed frequently, and it borrowed a lot from styles that were coming in other areas. Furthermore, these ladies wore lots of different styles depending on the occasions. They even wore foreign men's clothes when they played polo. And you can imagine that Chinese conservative moralists were horrified at the idea of A, women wearing men's clothes, and B, Chinese people wearing barbarian clothes. So there was a very lively fashion culture going on then. And I think it's important to be aware of that. Similarly, back in 10th century Japan, at the court of Heian Kyo, uh, one of the most important terms of praise was imamakashi. That meant up to date. This is a reproduction of a Heian court costume. And uh, all of the court ladies and gentlemen were very snobbish, and God forbid you should wear the costume that was last season or two, so two months ago. It was really over. People would just laugh at you. But in the countryside, Japanese peasants wore clothes that were very similar to those that their grandparents had worn. 
So even within a, the same culture, fashion could exist in one area, like at court, and not in other areas. Same in Europe. Um, you had various courtly cultures where fashion existed, and then a great mass of peasant culture where it didn't. You have to get out of the court into a bigger stage set to have fashion really take off as a phenomenon. And you start to see this in the Renaissance in, for example, the Italian city-states with the rise of capitalism and urbanism. And soon, people of all classes are wearing the latest modern fashions. And this is a, a detail from a Carpaccio painting of a scene in Venice on one of the canals. And it's at this period, especially young people are wearing the latest fashions. Older people might still wear what they'd worn 30 years ago, but young people were throwing away the old clothes, giving them away, and wearing something new. This was the time when Shakespeare said, fashion wears out more apparel than the man. Fashion also historically has followed power. Once there was a big center of power like Spain, say, in the late 15th century, everybody wore Spanish fashion, black. The Italians complained at first. They said, wear all our beautiful, colorful clothes. Everyone's in long black robes. Even the enemies of Catholic Spain, like you know, Dutch Calvinist burghers, were wearing black because that was the fashion. But after Spain faded in power and France rose up, then everyone around the Western world was wearing French fashion. In fact, Louis XIV's minister of finance, Colbert, said, what the gold mines of Peru were for Spain Fashion will be for France, a, a real motor for the economy. So you have all kinds of people making and wearing fashion and having that be central to the entire economy of the nation. Same in the 19th century. Women's fashion was dominated by Paris. And fashion magazines were translated into 20 different languages and sent all around the world, propagating the image of French fashion. At the same time, men's fashion was dominated by London for complicated historical reasons having to do with the earlier rise of capitalism and relative democracy in Great Britain. In Meiji era Japan, the Meiji emperor and his advisors announced that ruling class Japanese men and women had to wear Western dress. There is a possibly apocryphal story, probably apocryphal I would say, where that a medical doctor said to the emperor, you know, all our ladies have switched out of kimono, and now they're wearing corsets and bustles and heavy, long, French-style dresses. But these Western clothes are so much more unhealthy, to which the emperor allegedly said, Doctor, you may know about medicine, but I know about politics. And politics meant that to be modern, to be respected and treated as a modern nation, Japan felt that they had to be wearing modern Western clothes just like they sent out emissaries and found who the best soldiers in the world, the Prussians, the German, North Germans. So we'll get Brus Prussian military advisors in, Prussian-style uniforms. If you've been to Tokyo and you see the uniforms that the schoolboys wear, those are all descended from Prussian military uniforms, lo, these many years later. So they went around and said, who does the world's best fashion? France, fine, we're bringing in French-style women's fashion. Same thing happens in many countries. So when the Qing dynasty crumbled and fell in China, the former robes, the dragon robes of the Qing emperors were just tossed out as being feudal relics. People wanted modern clothes to be facing a dangerous modern world where you had to struggle against colonial powers. And the struggle extended to women's clothes as well. Most people look at qi paos, or as they're sometimes known, qiang sams, and think this is traditional Chinese women's clothing. Untrue. These were invented in the 1920s in big cities like Shanghai. Uh, and it's a mixture. It's part Chinese, part Manchu, part Western, part Chinese men's, because men wore long robes, and part Chinese women's. Mixed up together, modern urban Chinese women wore this, and they wore it with high-heeled shoes, not bound feet, to present a new image of themselves as modern. So this invention of a new style of authentically Chinese but authentically modern dress was part of the process. Here you see Galliano's take on it. And he, uh, this came from the fashion show in 1997, the year that Hong Kong reverted to China. Uh, that was just, I think, a gimmick for Galliano to use this style because he really loves it. It's a 
30s, 1930s, which is what he loves best, those bias cut dresses. And it's exotic and has kind of images of decadence in pre-revolutionary Shanghai. So this was sort of his look. And for most of the people who bought it and wore it, it was just sort of Galliano doing exoticism. That's got a long, long history in Western fashion. Um, just show you one example here. This is by Yves Saint Laurent from his 1967 haute couture collection, which highlighted African style. This goes long tradition. The French have been doing chinoiserie styles, turquoise styles. Now here's Africana styles. Very much uh, in the ether of the Parisian fashion system. I mean, Africa is a huge continent bigger than Europe. And how can you sum it up and say, well, this, this is Africa. It's like the idea of Africa in the designer's mind. One thing, though, that was different was happening in the 60s and 70s. As more and more people traveled around the world and more and more young people rejected the traditional fashion system, they started to increasingly wear elements of clothing taken from various cultures around the world. So, for example, caftan. And once it was picked up by hippies, and they picked up blue jeans and t-shirts as well as various ethnic garments, they became part of a new fashion vocabulary that designers picked it up from the street then, and then it filtered down to the mass market. Here you see Liz Taylor wearing what's obviously a very high fashion caftan. I'm going to go back to Saint Laurent for a minute. This is, of course, from his famous Chinese collection of 78-79. And to the extent that it's inspired by any kind of real China, it was clearly imperial China, or what women's wear daily called in their inimitable way, rich China, as opposed to in a minute you'll see what they called poor China. So, but really it's more inspired by a fantasy, a kind of cafe of the mind, where he takes little images of the things that seem vaguely Chinese. And you read the um, fashion press from this period, and it's really kind of uncomfortable reading because they talk about coolie hats and, you know, China girls. There's a lot of very loose, sort of at least borderline racist language going on in the way this kind of material is appropriated. Little, of course, did the French know that by the beginning of the 21st century, the whole Western fashion world would be trembling in fear that uh, China was going to take over the entire textile and fashion world. Uh, but that, of course, is all that anyone can talk about when you go to Europe nowadays, and which is something that is also implicit in the idea of globalization and fashion. It's been a long history of, of Western designers having clothes made in other countries, everywhere from Costa Rica to the Philippines. But it's quite another thing to have one part of the world, like China, suddenly making more and more and more and more of the clothing and textiles of the world, uh, to the point where American textile companies just fold up and close down and say, we're finished. There's no competing with China. Here you see the poor Chinese look, as women's wear put it. And again, many designers were inspired by Chinese peasants and workers' clothing, by the so-called Mao uniform, etc. This poster in the background, this is a photo from Italian Vogue, but the poster in the background is a rather menacing uh, poster warning people not to talk to foreigners. So I think the photographer didn't realize that. As so often, the uh, sort of Western uh, fashion people wandering through another culture don't quite know what's going on. Now, here's uh, the introductory scene in my exhibition, China Chic, East Meets West, that I put on in 99. And it shows an authentic dragon robe, you know, worn by ruling class Chinese men and female members of their families, representing the universe. And then next to it, a dress by the Chinese American designer, Vivian Tam, where she's taken the iconography of the imperial dragon, the symbol of yang, masculine force, etc., and the pearl, the symbol of yin, which the dragon is always chasing. So she lifts the iconography and puts it on a dress in a different material, a different style. And of course, you can just choose to wear this. If you wanted, you could instead wear her Maoist dress or her Buddhist dress. I mean, she's got lots of Chinese themes going. One reason I show this here is because um, I was recently called in to consult on another exhibition which is being planned by the Museum of African Art in New York because some of the curators had liked China Chic because it showed that China had fashion 
and the exchanges were not just Westerners ripping off China, but Chinese responding to the West, the interaction going back and forth, Chinese designers being re-inspired by their heritage, all the kind of things that the curators of the new African fashion show were interested in exploring in their upcoming show. So many of these issues are similar. Here you see Vivian's Mao dress, which is kind of like a spoof of Andy Warhol's image of Mao, except here he's like at a priest's outfit and sunglasses with his hair and pigtails, etc. This picture was one of the reasons why the, my book on China Chic, it was banned in the People's Republic of China because um, the still nominally Maoist authorities were not amused by this image. It's important to remember, though, that for the fashion system, exoticism exists at home, too. Youth culture in the 1960s was hugely exotic, not only to the French couture tradition, but to the mass manufacturers around the world. Like, who were these kids who were suddenly inventing their own fashions? It took a few years before people elsewhere in the world really understood what was happening. And then, of course, it swept everything in front of it, completely shook up even the gold standard of Paris couture by introducing new, cheap, disposable youth fashions. Subculture styles associated with music and movies are particularly influential. In fact, I think you could probably even argue, amazing as it sounds, that you know, a music video can be a bigger influence on fashion than a war. Um, which leads us to another question, which is, what are the levels of causal inspiration in fashion? So, for example, you have individuals, style setters. They could be designers, or they could be pop stars. Then you have great sort of world historical events which exist in the background. And in between the macro picture, you know, the big changes, the sort of anti-colonial movements and wars, etc., and the individual, which includes the individual consumer, not just the individual designer or trendsetter, in between you have what you might call the world of craft, which, which intersects, because there's lots of worlds of craft. There's the world of fashion, where fashion people look at what other fashion people do, and they read fashion magazines, and they know Galliano, and they're inspired by Galliano, and they don't realize that he didn't know what, what Dinka or Maasai, but they've only seen the Galliano image, and so they assimilate that. Or the world of music, where people know all the different groups, and one group will wear something, and then someone from another group will want to wear something to be like the first performer. So more and more fashion, the style tribes are like this. Small groups which look at others within their group for references. And the styles may be pretty nearly incomprehensible outside of that. I mean, if you're young, if you're into sort of music scene and you can sort of look at this and say, oh, yes, OK, that's sort of Rastafarian. Or if you're a fashion person, you might go, oh, right, I kind of remember when Rifat Ozbek, a Turkish designer based in London, did this Rastafarian collection. Or if you're like my dad, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, you don't understand any of the references at all that's going on. And it just kind of looks tight and short. That's about as much as he could get out of this image. Not quite sure what else is happening there in fashion terms. That's typical of now. Only some of us are really projecting to some other people. When I wear Japanese avant-garde fashion, most of my colleagues and, and the people on the street have no idea what I'm wearing. Uh, sometimes, or Belgian fashion, they'll run up and go, Miss, Miss, your skirt is caught. And I'm like, yes, it's supposed to be like that. You know, it's like, yes, I know, I know. It's not a mistake. It's actually supposed to look like that. In the same way here, look at Galliano. This outfit of his, it's no longer like with Saint Laurent where you could say, okay, he's doing his Chinese or he's doing his Africa, whatever that means. In this case, Galliano's got such a blender mix of different ethnic style looks is it Mongol? Is it, I mean, you don't know. You really have no idea, and so much of it is styling. This is incomprehensible for most members of the public. When they see this on fashion television or picture in a newspaper, they go, I've never seen anyone wear anything like that. But Galliano sells very, very well for Dior, but they don't wear the whole package. They'll wear one piece of it, like a jacket or a skirt. What most people wear the vast majority of consumers worldwide, male and female, more or less fashionable versions of vernacular sportswear, like this. 
It doesn't have to be Polo, Ralph Lauren, but you know, it's recognizably sportswear separates. This is what my friend, the, the anthropologist Joanne Eicher, calls world fashion, because it's what most of the people in the world wear. It might mix in elements of local, indigenous dress, but for the most part, it's this sort of universal sportswear. How many of you are wearing blue jeans? Like that's the quintessential world fashion garment or t-shirts. World fashion dominates the US and Europe just as it does Africa, Asia, and Latin America. It's different from high fashion, trendy, expensive designer fashion worn by a relatively small number of people. But it's not separated from it by a big gulf because most people, like the performers here from this group Jade, I mean, they're wearing elements of world fashion. It's like, okay, we're wearing sweatpants, etc. But it's fashionized. There's elements of underwear as outerwear. There's elements of Afrocentric style. It's all mixed in together, styled. And so you mix fashion and world fashion and elements of particular fashions from particular parts of the world. Another aspect of globalization, though, is uh, the proliferation of different fashion weeks all over the world. You know, I mean, it used to be you go to Paris and you see couture. Basta. That was it. When we're so open to the public, I mean, my parents, the most unfashionable people on the face of the earth, went to see a Dior fashion show when they went on their honeymoon in Paris because, like, you could just walk in if you were a tourist. It's no big deal. Now, it's huge, huge business all over the world. South Africa, the first fashion week was in 97. Now there's three fashion weeks. Um, there are two in Brazil and Sao Paulo and Rio. They're cropping up everywhere. And this is a big part of what we mean by the globalization of fashion. It's not just a question of non-Western designers showing in Paris, although we'll talk about that in a minute. It's also fashion being created, produced, photographed, disseminated around the world. Even when it was just mostly Paris, Milan, New York, back, you know, 20 years ago, a lot of the fashions were produced, they were manufactured elsewhere, as we said, everywhere, you know, from Costa Rica to the Philippines. But the image was they were associated with these metropolitan centers at the center of the world of fashion. Now, everywhere from Brazil to India, South Africa uh, to Finland, you've got fashion weeks going. Even if relatively few international fashion journalists or buyers come, the existence of these fashion weeks nevertheless helps. It helps the local economy. It helps build an infrastructure for the local fashion business. And this, again, is particularly important at this moment in time when more and more of the world's textiles and fashions are mass produced in China. And this is getting harder and harder for people to compete with elsewhere. You know, if it's hard for the Italians to compete with it, it's really hard for the Thais to compete with it. I mean, suddenly it's just the, the scale is so enormous. Places like India and Brazil are fairly well situated to compete with that, partly because they have already been manufacturing clothing for Western companies for years. So they have a certain amount of experience. They've got the factory set up. The next logical step was to highlight local talent. And India's been particularly successful, I think, and to also Brazil to some extent, because not only does it have this long tradition of textile manufacturing, it also has a huge internal market. That's very important. And that's, in one respect, uh, South Africa has a lot of potential there, not only as the sort of headquarters for South African fashion, but potentially as the headquarters for African fashion entirely, as the great regional center for it. You have an internal market. Um, there, there is not, however, so much tradition of manufacturing ready to wear here. Another thing that they have in India, which I think is something that designers here will want to think about, because the Indians have been doing this for so long, I think they're less susceptible to what's been called the auto-exotic gaze. Not auto-erotic, but auto-exotic. The habit of looking at yourselves through the eyes of Westerners or foreigners. And Westerners look at you and go, ooh, how exotic, a sari. Um, but if you're there wearing it and it's a fashion sari and it's being shown on a fashion runway designed by an Indian designer, worn by Indian consumers in Indian fashion magazines in that season's thick colors, then you start to not look at it as exotic. It's fashion maybe, but it's not exotic. So you're not thinking about yourself and your own culture in terms of cliches. 
This is super important. This is, I, we'll get to this again in a minute, but when the Japanese had the big, big impact on international fashion in the 1980s, totally revolutionized it. It was not the early Japanese like Hanai Mori who showed like, you know, Western evening dresses with little cherry blossoms on them to say this is Japanese. That didn't impress anybody. I mean, everybody done little cherry blossoms if they wanted to do a Japanese theme. You have to get beyond that to get somehow deeper into what your own culture is so you're not seeing it through the exoticizing eyes of foreigners. Here we have an example of a fashion from Sun Goddess. So one of the things I wanted to talk about here is how could South Africa become more competitive? I was in the fashion section this morning, so I, I didn't get to hear um, brand the beloved country. But I'd already written in my notes uh, last week that one of the important things, it seems to me, is that South Africa needs to have a brand identity. So if Paris has got this sort of chic, creative thing, and Italy's got luxury sportswear, like it's easy, but it's elegant, it's luxurious, that's Italy. Um, what's the South African brand identity going to be? And I think there's a lot of potential there because the, there is a very positive image of South Africa as a country. You sort of brand, just as an individual will want to brand himself or herself as a designer, as a creator, so the country needs to. Then too, to what extent is it enough to draw on your own tradition? Now of course, absolutely, this is crucial to having your own fashion industry. Curator Jose Tennyson of the Netherlands did a big show about global fashion and local traditions. And she wrote, quote, the exotic, end quote, authenticity of a product is so important in fashion at the moment that it is tumbling the whole fashion hierarchy upside down, end quote. Personally, I'm not so sure. Um, partly because I think the whole idea of authenticity is a chimera, an imaginary beast. It doesn't really exist or at least not in a way that can be marketed. Um, everyone wants to be authentic, but what actually is that? As uh, I was talking with someone earlier, and he was saying, we have to get out of the curio shop. So you draw into your traditions, but where do you go from there? How do you keep building on the future of it? And I'll just show you a few pictures here of uh, Hussein Chalayan, a Turkish, Turkish Cypriot. Um, who studied in London and now shows in Paris. In this collection, he drew on his Turkish heritage, but he increasingly deconstructed it. Because most um, consumers in the West, if you want to have a global brand, do not want to wear somebody else's local traditional clothes. I mean, they just, they don't. They might wear it for a party, but they're not going to wear it in general. Something like this looks weird to a straight audience, but at least it's part of a sort of conceptual deconstruction fashion which is understood in the global marketplace. The global fashion business is super hard. And someone like Hussein has been treated as a, a, a young, sort of really up and coming designer, but he's still, he's a hard sell. A lot of people go, well, he's too conceptual. Here he has a theme based on refugees. So um, you're packing up and carrying everything with you, including putting on and wearing the, the coffee table. African designers exist at home but a few of them also have existed on the world stage, such as in Paris. The company Huli But, which is Balinese for keep your eyes open, was founded by Lamine Kuyate, uh, who was born in 62 in Mali and established a business in Paris, which has had a rocky time, I mean, in terms of a functioning fashion business. I remember a few years ago, he opened a little shop in New York, but within six months, it had closed again. He was one of the first doing this sort of recycled old clothes idea. Um, but he was asked once, um, what was African about Huli But? And he said, myself, everything, nothing. It's very, again, the question of what is authentic? What is African? What does it even mean to say in Africa? I mean, what part of Africa? What aspect of Africa? So he's talented, like Chilean's talented, but do they really individually represent the globalization of fashion or just the appearance on the global fashion stage of a few players who come from the periphery rather than the center? This is where the Japanese are important because Japanese fashion changed everything, as I said, in the 80s, completely revolutionized it. They didn't look at, at kimono. I mean, that had been done. Westerners had seen kimono. Um, 
But someone like Rei Kawakubo, Kamde de Garçon, or Yoji Yamamoto didn't look at cherry blossoms. They didn't look at any of those stereotypical images. Instead, they looked deeper into the aesthetic of Japanese culture and found, for example, like you notice this is asymmetrical. Well, Western aesthetics say symmetry is beautiful. If one side is long, the other side must be long. Japanese aesthetics said, no, no, asymmetry, irregularity, even imperfection is more beautiful than perfection and symmetry because it allows you to fill in the blanks in your own mind. So kind of going deeply into this aesthetic while also being deeply involved in a modern fashion culture in Japan. And long before Ray showed in Paris, she had built up a whole network of young women in Japan who wore her clothes. And they were all there, all dressed in black, as she said in those early years, she designed in 12 shades of black. So a hostile Japanese press said they were like a flock of ravens, all in black, swathing around in these strange, irregular clothes. But she had her group, her niche. And so then when she brought it to Paris to show, everyone freaked out. They said it's like post-Hiroshima bag lady fashion. It's horrible. It's ugly. We, we show off our bodies in the West. We don't want to wear big, shapeless, weird, ripped-looking clothes. But within a couple of years, black was the fashion color. Oversizing was fine. Ripped launched the whole deconstruction thing that Chanel Couture does it now. I mean, everybody does it. The whole world was shaken up by the way they went deeper, deeper into Japanese aesthetics. And they brought something which was genuinely new to the world stage. Alexander Hershkovitz is one young designer I see in Brazil who might have the potential to be a sort of global player. Brazil is certainly a regional player in the fashion world with big fashion scene in Sao Paulo. Um, Alexander showed in Sao Paulo, then he showed in London, Paris, now he's showing in New York. The clothes have nothing like nothing Carmen Miranda about it. I mean, it's not that image of Brazil with the bananas on the head. But he definitely has a sensibility which draws on certain styles from urban street styles in um, big cities in Brazil, often really working class or even sort of lumpen proletarian way of styling clothes. Plus, he's aware of and really was influenced by, well, oddly enough, by the Japanese and also by um, French designers like Thierry Mugler, so the sort of really wild sex pot thing, except now he's done it in rubber, because being Brazilian and thinking in terms of the Amazon and rubber, he's done a lot of rubber clothes. So potentially, I think you could see some more Brazilian fashion beyond like the dental floss bikini idea of Brazilian fashion, but Brazilian clothes that sell at retail, ready to wear around the world. I'm going to close with this uh, image of Naomi Campbell wearing Jean-Paul Gaultier haute couture. This is from 2005. Because this particular dress incorporates Dutch wax print cloth, which, as you know, was inspired by Javanese batik, which was originally made for the African market. So this image, with this packed-in history that this audience knows, but most fashion audiences wouldn't, this image reminds us that fashion has long been a global phenomenon. But the circumstances have changed significantly since the age of colonialism and the whole succeeding era of anti-colonialism, civil rights movement, liberation. We may still be at the stage when Western designers like Gautier travel the world sampling the aesthetic and craft traditions of other cultures. But we also seem to be in the early stages of a more profoundly global exploration of fashion, culture, and identity. Thank you very much.